formal organization is something we're all familiar with. It's strategy, a structure, processes, metrics. It aligns the behaviors in an organization. The informal organization goes across the organization rather than up and down. They're more emotional interactions between people that have nothing to do with their formal responsibilities. When the two work together, the organization performs very well. When they don't work together, the organization is inhibited. Many people believe the informal organization is unruly chaos that can't be managed. We partially agree. It can't be managed in the same way as the formal organization, but it can be mobilized and influenced. I first learned about the informal organization in the Navy, surprisingly enough. I was assigned to a ship where I ran into two very different officers. Charlie Stewart, the supply officer that I reported to, and William Inskeep, who was the first lieutenant. Charlie was a very informal guy. Inskeep was a formal officer, start to finish. So if you worked for Inskeep, you did what you were told, but that's all you did. If you worked for Charlie Stewart, you did what you knew his intent was. This came to light in one interesting episode. We were having an admiral's inspection. We were supposed to be in full dress, which included a sword, uh, even though those were only recently issued. Um, the day before the inspection, the captain called us in and said he had changed his mind about the formal sword salute because he was afraid we would screw it up. At the time of that meeting, both Inskeep and Stewart were on shore. When they came back on board, Charlie's men told him about the change. Inskeep's men did not tell him. When the Admiral came on board, we all saluted with a hand salute, except for Inskeep. He pulled his sword out with a flourish, knocked the Admiral's cap off. It was an example of how an informally motivated crew will take care of its leader, whereas a formally motivated crew will not. The shipboard Navy is a disciplined military organization, yet we just saw how the informal elements of that organization can take you places and do things that the formal cannot. We're now going to look at an informal musical group, and we will see just the opposite. The Orpheus Chamber Orchestra is a world-class musical group. They perform to audiences across the globe, have won Grammys, and regularly sell out at Carnegie Hall. There's one thing they don't have, a conductor. The group was founded on the premise that musicians themselves should democratically interpret and guide their performance rather than relying on the formal role of a conductor. And this leads to music that just has a different quality and the audiences notice the difference. However, this approach takes a lot of time and energy and as Orpheus started to perform more and more, musicians were getting tired, frustrated and started to leave. Orpheus took a step back thought carefully about the problem and introduced a formal solution. A smaller group of elected musicians would make the preliminary decisions about how to interpret the music and then bring in the rest of the group. This core group would rotate throughout the season and by partnering with different people in smaller, closer ways, they were able to in fact tighten the connections that they had with each other. With this formal change, the Orpheus musicians were able to continue applying their full informal passion to a growing number of performances. They got the best of both, the informal and the formal together. Most organizations, however, face a different challenge. In this next example, we'll see how an overly formal structure was able to introduce more informal passion. When I first met Michael Sabia, the Chief Executive Officer of Bell Canada, he was explaining his frustration in uh, running a major transformational change program. Despite changes in strategy, structure, process, and programs, he wasn't getting enough change in the behaviors of people, particularly those interacting with customers. So we decided to start by looking at some of the pride builders, master motivators. We started with a group of 12. We did basic case studies of them, and we quickly learned that they were doing a few things that seemed straightforward, but that most members of the same supervisory group across the organization were not doing. The managers who got the best results all took the time to get to know their teams personally. This behavior of getting to know your people didn't exist in training manuals, and there was no time to roll it out in the training programs. So we decided to spread it virally. We created what we call a community of practice who got together, shared stories, and learned from each other. So Bell Canada was able to spread this unusual motivational capability from the original 12 Pride Builders to over 1,500 in less than 18 months. The Pride Builders' secret 
is he knows how to make people feel good about the work itself. It's really interesting how leaders learn to use the informal. Leading outside the lines represents the best of what we've learned over the years. We include a framework to help leaders understand when to use the informal, when to use the formal, and how the two should work together. The primary message of the book is not that the formal or the informal, uh, one is better than the other. The primary message is it's important to get them working together. Mm -hmm.